All right, welcome back, grade 10. We just spent uh, the good part of two days looking at Gandhi and India, and I need to return back to why we did that. And then we need to wrap up the case study of India. And then today we're gonna move into the Industrial Revolution. Tomorrow we'll look at ideologies. So for all intents and purposes, we'll be done this unit before the weekend, giving you some time on the weekend to review, because as you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, next week, we have our midterm. So we have three days, because there's three parts. We have one part for the sources, one part for the essay, and one part for the multiple choice. And with regards to the essay, you have the essay topic. It's been released for 10 days on Google Classroom. And one of the main reasons why we watched the Gandhi video is so that you're gonna have something to talk about in your essay. Please keep in mind that the exams, though, are exams, so they're not open notes. So if you are gonna be writing about Gandhi, it's gonna to have to be something that you have you know, committed to your memory, something that you've learned, not something that you'll just recopy. So that's the next challenge, right? The next challenge is to be able to, to bring it in, but not bring it in on paper or in a document, but bring it in in your mind. So. It, it is an obstacle for sure. But going back to India, before I wrap up the case study, do we have any questions about the movie? Was there something that happened in the movie? Was there an event, a character, an idea that you'd like me to revisit? Yes? Why did he go to jail the last time? Why did he go to jail the last He goes to jail so many times. Often it's sedition, right? Yeah. Sedition is attempting to overthrow the government. So sedition, in, in this case, was because he was disobeying British law, and he was organizing others to disobey British law. By doing that, he was suggesting that the British government didn't have authority to govern in India, and therefore the end goal, and he said the end goal was home rule, so he was guilty of sedition, which is a serious crime. In some countries, you get shot for it. Any other questions from the video, from the movie? Any people, any ideas, any events? So the purpose of the movie, the purpose of the film study, was to be able to explore the essay prompt. So you don't need to write me a report. Please don't write me a report on on the movie or, or a movie review, a film review. I need you to use the events of the movie to further an argument that is in response to the prompt. So when you write an essay, the first step is much like the A1. You have to write an introduction where you unpack the language of the prompt. You need to tell me what does it mean? So in the intro to your essay next week, you need to explore what does it mean that the strong do what they can and we suffer what they must. Tell me a little history about where that idea came from. Tell me about the Athenians. Tell me about the Molotians. Tell me about realism and natural selection and social Darwinism and survival of the fittest and, and might is right. All those connected ideologies. Tell me about the significance of that concept. You know, if we allow that concept to shape the global village, what does it mean? It creates disparity, right? It, it justifies genocide. That's the significance of it. And then tell me about the division of society. Who might not agree with that kind of behavior? I think we have an individual, Gandhi, that would suggest that people cannot, in the global village, just do what they wish, that we, need to resist them. We need to resist the might of the British Empire. So in the intro, you're gonna unpack the language of the source. In the intro, you're going to talk about how the source has an ideological perspective, an opinion about globalization, about how we should behave with one another in the global village. And you connect it to the history behind the quote and related stuff like realism. Definitely though, in the analysis of source, you want to mention how 
there is a perspective in the source. This is what the source, these are the values the source has. But there's also assumptions, right? That we can say that there's assumptions and a bias that others may reject. So that's the first step, the analysis of source, which is the introduction. So there's no separate introduction paragraph. The analysis is the introduction. And typically, an analysis, and I've given you many examples of essays, but typically an analysis of source paragraph will be in the three quarters to one and a, one and a quarter kind of page range. So that's something to shoot for, you know, 200 to 300 words for the analysis. What we don't want to do is do a three sentence analysis and do an incomplete job, because then, as I mentioned at the beginning of the year, then you cannot score higher than 58% on the essay, because you haven't fully unpacked the source before you try to respond to it. So the analysis is the first step, and being that you already have the source, there's no reason not to do an analysis ahead of time. Have it kind of a rough draft in mind. But after the analysis, you need a thesis statement, and that's the final sentence of your introductory paragraph. We don't want to make the marker go searching for a thesis statement. And I mentioned this earlier, but I'll re-mention it now, that a thesis statement is a statement. It's not a question. If you have a thesis question, then you're not writing an argumentative essay. You're writing an exploratory essay, and you should get a zero. So if you mess up one sentence, you could get a zero. So hopefully, hopefully this is resonating with you, that the thesis statement is a statement, not a question. Is my client guilty? That's, that's, not, that's not a statement, right? My client is innocent because of this, this, and this. We need that kind of statement. A statement that really helps organize the body. So your statement should be able to be broken down into sub-arguments. And I would suggest to you that we now have, in the India case study, an argument that you could use India as, as one example to show a response to realism, response to the strong do with the can, weak suffer what the must. We're going to continue though, we're going to look at the Industrial Revolution and we'll see the same philosophy, you know, the strong group they can, weak stuff where they must, uh, in the Industrial Revolution. And we'll even see some ideologies like Marxism created because, like Gandhi, some thought that, you know what, maybe the weak can become the strong. So maybe that's a part of your thesis statement. So before we move on to the Industrial Revolution, I do want to wrap up the case study on India. There is this lesson, lesson number 12. It's in our digital textbook. I've shared it out with you. Um, everything in the digital textbook, like everything we do is in that one digital textbook. I would suggest to you that if you're planning to use India as a case study, and I'm gonna say this right now, that your evidence is incomplete if you don't. Incomplete is 40%. But we spent a lot of time on India. So if you're gonna use India as a case study, there's some additional notes here for you that you can read through as you're planning your essay. So I'm not gonna read through the entire document to you. You know, there's, there's a point as a student in an academic stream that you know, there's some onus on you to visit some work um, on, on, on your time. So there's some stuff here that you can read through, but there is some stuff I'd like to highlight as well. I'm not gonna read through it all. There are some things that I've pulled for you that you can scan through and see. You know, what works with your thesis statement and what doesn't work? You know, don't borrow stuff that doesn't further your perspective. Only grab evidence that continues the logic of your perspective. That's kind of key. But I do want to summarize some stuff about India after the British leave today. To some extent, I'm doing this because I know that you may see sources like this or this on the multiple choice. How would I test you in multiple choice or how would I test you in an A1? I might give you a cartoon like this one and ask you to tell me about the ideological perspective of. And in this cartoon, it's neat because she has a perspective 
They have perspectives. The cartoonist has a perspective. So there's multiple perspectives here. She's in fear because she's been abandoned by these individuals. These individuals are playing a game of politics as they're trying to compete to see what kind of constitution, what kind of, what kind of India should they create. But as they're involved in a little political game, they've left the nation exposed to famine and civil war. So the cartoonist is saying these individuals, the politicians like Don, you're being negligent. And perhaps India was better off under British rule. Because under British rule, they didn't have to worry about civil war and famine. So definitely one way to be held accountable for this is through some source analysis. And that could happen on multiple choice as well, and that's why I gave you some sample multiple choice there. I have some last links here that I'm gonna go through a couple with you as we finish this up. So problems faced after independence. So there is a strong wink wink possibility that in your A1 next week, there's gonna, going to be a source, a cartoon, that looks at India before and after. Before and after decolonization. And we want to understand that India doesn't become the ashram that Gandhi had hoped. It doesn't become some kind of utopian paradise. So they do have some problems. We already know that India, after independence, following August of 47, they face a civil war and they end up balkanizing. Pakistan and Bangladesh end up being created. So one thing that we already know is that you know, India, India doesn't really exist after the British League. India has changed. India is broken apart. So, and it's broken apart along cultural religious lines. So one of the things the British was trying to communicate to Gandhi is, uh, it's not as simple as we walk away. You, know, you, you think one day the British will just walk away. But we have a responsibility to you know, both Muslims and Hindu and princely states like Kashmir. And although you're, you're part of the majority, Gandhi, we have to worry about the minorities living within India. So because of the ethnic and cultural religious uh, diversity of India, it, it couldn't remain. It couldn't, it couldn't uh, exist after the British left. We've talked in the past about how conflict between Pakistan and India wasn't just a one-time event. And in fact, uh, they'll fight again over Bangladesh. India will come to the aid of uh, East Pakistan, which is now called Bangladesh, as East and West Pakistan go to war with each other. And I suggested to you that both India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons now, and this could be where nuclear weapons will be used next. We also saw briefly in the movie the refugee problem in India and the flood of people that were just uh, you know, left to, because of the politics that, that they were, um, what word am I searching for here? Uprooted, right? So we had millions of people that had to relocate as pockets of Muslims and Hindus had to be cleansed from certain territories and even in that part, you know, we had high casualties. As we saw in the video, they started fighting as the two refugee trains went in, in opposite directions. We also have a Kashmir problem where um, both sides, India and Pakistan, claim control over this territory of Kashmir. So India is officially a democracy today. It's the largest democracy population-wise in the world. But some people look at India of 2020 and say it's becoming a dictatorship. So that's an issue as well. India has had a series of, uh, of um, assassinations of some of their prominent leaders, including leaders that are connected by family to both Nehru and Gandhi. As I suggested yesterday, those families uh, end up being united by marriage. India has had war with China, but one of the main themes that we've had um, with India, unfortunately, is that the oppressive elite that was the British, that here are being said that you know they stole $45 trillion from India. India is often said to be the richest country in the world, rich of resources. 
used to be the center of the world, and some would say it eventually will be the center again, but the British people stole $45 trillion of wealth from it. The argument is that perhaps that oppression continues today. That if you go to India, there's still mass poverty because there's a new group of oppressors, and that would be the Indian elite. Because they still have the caste system, you still have massive disparity between the rich and poor in India. So we have disparity here in Canada. We have rich and poor in Canada. We have rich and poor in Metasma. We have some people that are millionaires and some that are not. But the gap between the rich and poor in India is much larger because of the caste system, because of the cultural acceptance of it, and because the same kind of oppressive exploitation that the British had against the Indians, now many Indian oligarchs have against the Indians. That's a key message coming out of this as well. So, lots of great links here that talk about, you know, you know, did the British Empire benefit India? And we talked about things like the gift of the railway, the gift of the English language, but you know, was it truly a gift that was worth being exploited to the cost of $45 trillion? As we finish up India, um, that's something that you need to be thinking of, is did the British Empire benefit the Indian people? And I'll leave it at that.